Someone was uh, remarking to me about why I uh, spent some time on the old folks this morning. And if somebody said, you sure kept people awake, I guess that might have to do some of my demonstrations. I'll tell you why I spent some time on the old folks, is I is one of them. But there's something I think we overlook. How old are our presidential candidates? Now, how would you like to be taking on that task of what they've been doing for all this time, regardless of what you think about them, just what they're doing. Don't they know they ought to have quit five or six years ago? They're old folks, and they're out there acting like young folks. But in the greatest work of all, the spread of the gospel, defense of the faith, we get 60, we try to quit. Now you figure that out. They're laboring for something that hasn't got a thing in the world to do with going to heaven. And there's not a one of them that can even be thought of as a Christian, not according to the New Testament definition. And yet they're just fighting. To, don't they know 20 years from now they'll be pushing up daisies and probably long before that? Or pushing up something. Some of them, top stuff they push up, I don't know what it would be. But the point is, can't we see that people give their lives to that which has nothing to do but with this world and it's gone? And they're entering into a world totally unprepared. And they're just burning the candle at both ends in the middle every other way. But in the church, we just kind of, greatest work there is. Kingdom of the Lord, the army of the Lord. Soul savers. The hope of the world. God has put into our hands the gospel. The song says in our hands the gospel is given. God expects us to get the power of God to save out to every creature. We need to stop and rethink some of our attitudes. That's why that I dealt with things as I did this morning that area. And if it's kind of like rubbing your nose in it, then I hope to rub some more. Now, to what I said we were going to do. So you want to be an elder. Well, I'm not talking about the women. Although some may want to be. The Bible doesn't allow women to be elders. But we hope we understand that we're talking about people who want to serve God. People who want to serve according to the authority of Jesus Christ. People who want to have the church like the Lord wants the church. Also thinking about the future. I said this a long time ago and I said it several times. If this building is still here and a religious group meets in it 10 years, 20, 30 years from now, whatever. Even if a, another building is built on this side and religious people are meeting in it. What will they believe? How will they live their lives? What will they teach? What will they oppose and what will they stand up for? Well, we can't control when we're no longer here. But we can lay groundwork. We can teach those who are younger. And that's the way God intended it. Because the Lord's church is fundamentally, primarily, first, foremost, and always a teaching institution. So I'm going to really be having a study of what the Bible teaches concerning elders, shepherds. And when I say, so you want to be an elder, when you look at the qualifications, then of course, one must desire to be an elder. Then Paul says, well, let him know if he desires to be an elder, he desires a good work. Some people say, well, desire is one of the qualifications, but it's not quite like the other qualifications. It just simply says, so you want to be a shepherd of souls. Okay, if you want to be a shepherd of souls, then here is the kind of character, Christian character, mature spirituality that you must be developing. And then we get into it. But the way I'm going to approach this is to a great extent by looking at the duties of the elders. And then we'll get into qualifications. So this is going to go for a while, Lord willing. And I want to begin by noticing what Paul said to the Ephesian elders as the inspired Luke recorded in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Now, if a man here is thinking about preparing himself, qualify himself, but that's what it means, qualifying himself to serve in the capacity of a bishop, which is the same as an elder, which is the same as a presbyter, which is the same as a pastor, different terms referring to the same work and office, then I think that looking at the duties of elders may make us appreciate more why the qualifications are like they are. Now listen to what Paul said. He, he didn't call 
the influential, wealthy members or whatever of the church at Ephesus to him. He didn't call uh, any leading members of any kind, women or whatever. He didn't call the deacons. But he called the elders to him. And they weren't even meeting in the city where Ephesus was, or rather where the church was in Ephesus. Verse 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves. Right there and drive a big nail down. It begins right where the qualifications, which we'll look at later on, begin. And that is taking heed to yourself. How can you qualify yourself if you do not take heed to yourself? Well, you can. These are already meeting the qualifications. They, they, they have the qualifications. They've been appointed elders. They're elders of the church in Ephesus. They still have the obligation before God and for the good of themselves and the good of the church that they take heed unto themselves. They pay attention to themselves. They look within their own mind. So you see, not only do you have concerning all Christians, examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith, but this carries one up on it. As elders, and all God says elders are to do, and all the qualifications of elders, then you take heed to yourselves as elders. Not just as Christians, but as elders take heed to yourselves. Then you take heed not to some of the flock, but all of the flock. So it all begins with the individual. You're going to become a Christian, you'll have to take heed to yourself as to what's involved in becoming a Christian. Same would be true of deacons. Same would be true of anything. If you're going to become a husband or a wife, thus you're going to be married, you're going to have to take heed unto yourself according to the man or the woman. It all comes down to taking heed to ourselves and service to God. Because service means we're doing things God's way. So take heed to yourselves, then unto all the flock, and then notice, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Well, does God, via the third person of the Godhead, speak directly from heaven and say, uh, tap you on the shoulder one night, and a still voice says, I want you to be an elder? No. The Holy Spirit makes men elders today just like he made them elders then. Even though there was the miraculous element still in the church. And why was it there? Because they did not have a completed written down New Testament. That's why it was there. Those things passed away. But the qualifications of elders remain the same. And so God makes men elders in the same way today that he did then and vice versa and always will. And that's when they meet the qualifications God in his word has set down. When they qualify themselves, what are the qualifications? Well, they're set out and we'll study them later. But whose qualifications are they? They're God's qualifications. You see, when when a person becomes a Christian and they hear the word of God, they understand it, belief in Christ is formed, they obey the commandments of repenting of their sins, confessing their belief in Christ as the Son of God, being baptized for the remission of sins. See, God made them a Christian, but not without their cooperation. They had to understand their duty to God through the message. So God did for them what they couldn't do for themselves, but he's always expected men to do something that they could do. And they can hear and learn the gospel. They can examine themselves. They can see their sinful condition. They can know how God wants them to be saved. They can uh, comply with what is stipulated in the gospel that's their responsibility in becoming Christians. God made me a Christian, but not without my cooperation. And so it is. That the Holy Spirit makes men elders. But it doesn't mean it's without their cooperation. And their cooperation in this case is to learn the qualifications set out. Having desired to become an elder. And then they qualify themselves. Just like you qualify yourself to become a Christian. It's all a matter of qualification. You know every atheist today will give an account someday to God as to why they weren't in worship assembly. We say they couldn't. They don't believe in God. You see, they should have qualified themselves to be here. They should have believed in God. They should have believed in Christ. They should have obeyed the gospel. They should have assembled to worship God as God wants them to. So it was a matter of qualification. Of course an atheist is not going to assemble to worship God. But he should have been qualifying himself. The evidence is clear that God exists. The truth is clear as to proving Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. The truth is clear in God's Word how to become a Christian and why you should. 
and then how the church is organized and the work of the church and the life of individual Christians and the worship of the church and the mission of the church and the destiny of the church. So when it says, take heed therefore unto yourselves to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, it's a matter of men cooperating with God by submitting to those things that qualify them to be elders. Making their lives such that it fits the identifying marks of an elder. It's character building in a certain way. And fundamentally, we'll just say this now, that uh, really when you look at the qualification of elders, it is pretty much saying this is a very mature, experienced man in serving God. He's been tried. He's proven himself. He stayed with the truth through thick and thin. Men outside the church, though they may not be uh, thinking as Christians, they recognize it in his everyday duty. He has proven honest in his business dealings, etc., etc. So all of that must be taken into consideration. That means there must be some time and growth for a man to reach that stage. So the idea is that they're mature. That's the idea of the word elder. We'll say more about that later. Now, what's their primary duty? Well, in a general way, it's set out here to feed the church of God. Now, that's going to be developed as we go on through this. Suffice it to say, when you know what feeding is, and we just went past the noon hour, that that has to do with uh, giving what your body needs, and in our case in America, usually a whole lot more, uh, to sustain it and to make it function as physical bodies must. So they're feeding the spiritual body of Christ. And they're working, as we know from the rest of the study, over each congregation. Remembering this, folks, there's no larger or smaller organized entity of the worldwide body of Jesus Christ, the one church, than the church in any given location, any geographic location. In other words, you don't have a worldwide president of the church with various people under him in certain districts throughout the world. No, there's Christ ruling in heaven. His authority is manifested on earth in the New Testament. When people obey the gospel, they're added to the church, universal. And yet the church never does anything except in a congregation with elders and deacons and preachers and teachers and individuals in certain geographic locations, the church in Jerusalem, the church in Corinth, the church in Rome. There is no, don't try to organize the, the worldwide church. It's not organized in that way. It's organized just as this church right here is, and that's why we function as we do. It's not just according to our tradition. It's the way the New Testament authorizes this congregation to be organized. So take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church, to provide what's necessary for the church to remain the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So how did the church come into existence? Jesus purchased it with his blood. Well, who makes up the church? People. When was the blood applied to a person to cleanse that person of his or her sins? When they heard, believed, and individually obeyed the gospel. And thus they're added by the Lord to the church. They begin to assemble and organize as the Lord in the New Testament teaches them to assemble, organize, and function in a congregation such as this one. But the Lord purchased the church. That establishes the fact the church does not belong to the elders. It doesn't belong to the preacher. It doesn't belong to any human being. It belongs to Jesus Christ by right of having built it and purchased it with his blood. But it tells us what we are. It tells us why we should seek the purity of every member living like the New Testament says. We're to be pure as the New Testament defines purity. Living our lives according to what a Christian should do. That's set out in the Bible. So we're purchased with the blood of Christ. The church belongs to Christ. It is worth the purchase price. To say the church doesn't mean anything is to denigrate the purchase price of it. Surely the church was worth the price Jesus paid for it. Now what does that do to our study of elders? Well, it would be good if all elders everywhere are remembering that they're to keep that church like the Lord wants it. They are too in all these areas where God has not specified, and we'll elaborate on that more later, Things to be done, they're to take care of those things and make sure that the obligations God has said must be done are carried out in the quickest and best way possible, the expedient way, the advantageous way. So that's our verse that we're going to use to start us off on this. 
because I think it helps us see this is an extremely important topic. Some years ago, I was visiting with a preacher and an elder. We were by ourselves. And I made the comment, I said, you know, if elders are doing what God says elders ought to do, a whole host of problems in the church will be nipped in the bud pretty quickly. And the preacher, whom I consider to be weak as water, spoke of it and said, well, there, there's enough problems to go around. That wasn't even the point. And the preacher sometimes can't get a point. It makes me wonder what's going on. Yes, you can have rotten preachers. There are some of them, and there have been and there will be. Deacons, you can have rotten deacons. Bible class teachers, same way. Members of the church, well, they've never been known to be rotten, have they? All right, that's going to be. Now, who did God put in charge of the church to see that it is as God wants it? Well, you say, we all have our play. Yeah, I'm to preach the word. But you also have obligations to help each other live right. We talked about some of that this morning, didn't we? But who has that special obligation to keep the church like, the God, like the God wants it to be? And if it is not in the purview and work of elders, then I do not know. Because they have an obligation that nobody else in a congregation has. And so you want to be an elder? You better learn that, the first thing, or else don't want to be one. If you don't want to be an elder, as God describes an elder why do you want to be one if you don't want to work in such a way as to keep the church the lord's church why do you want to be one do you realize what this means about being vigilant and knowing what's going on how does that affect the idea see then that you walk circumspectly not as fools but as wise redeeming the time for the days of evil now apply that general statement that's to be applied to all christians to live faithful now apply it to the work of elders especially especially their work you know, Garfield, President Garfield, who was assassinated after first one after Lincoln, was a member of the Lord's Church. Now, he went with a digression, which was the Christian church of the 19th century, but he lived and died when that digression had got, not gone nearly as far as it finally would and has. But he made the statement when he was elected that he was stepping down from the eldership to serve in a lesser office. Well, whatever he turned out to be, he was right about that. There is no greater office on this earth than the under shepherds to Jesus Christ. No greater. No greater responsibility than to realize Jesus has entrusted in me because I qualified myself to serve as an elder, to keep his church like he wants it, regardless of what may come or not come. So I hope you're seeing right in the beginning, there is no more, ser no more serious work on this earth than to be a faithful elder in the Lord's church. So it's a very important topic. And we can't really understand it without first understanding what I've already touched on, and that is the very mission of the church and the importance of that mission. And the work of the church, to explain it a little bit, I've already said it, I think I said it this morning, is to save souls. Christ came to seek and save the lost. Luke 19.10. The church is the spiritual body of Jesus Christ, with Christ as its head, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And it is to continue the same work that Christ came to do. He's given it to us. Now, how is this work going to be accomplished? Well, stated, for lack of a better way to put it in a nutshell, is by evangelism. evangelism. Something's wrong with the church of our Lord that doesn't want to evangelize, that doesn't want to save folks like they were saved. And yet I think it's very easy to forget that. It's very easy to see members forget about souls in sin all around us. And our duty is to wake them up and show them the way of righteousness. To make known the gospel of Christ is the meaning of evangelism. It is, in effect, the way that we are the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3.15. Remember that Paul told Timothy that if he tarried long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the church of God, in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So how is evangelism accomplished? Well, of course, it's accomplished by the preaching of the word, by the teaching of the truth, by the spread of the gospel. But then it's accomplished by the way members live, the examples we set, 
I liked Leroy Brownlow's book on Christian living, some do's and don'ts for the Christian. Now that's reducing it down, just where it ought to be. It comes right down to practical living, doing what's right, leaving undone what's wrong. By word, that means by writing the Word of God or explaining the Word of God. Just read through the book of Acts. You'll see that done in various ways. By deed, by showing in one's life. The actual things we do, the works we perform, the principles of the gospel of Christ lived out in our lives. Now we have some negative examples. You'll remember in Acts 5, there's Ananias and Sapphira. Well, their word was one thing, but their deeds were something else. So you see, you got it coming both ways. Here's what you're to teach. Here's what, how you're to live. Now, how should we not live? Look at Ananias and Sapphira. There's a good negative example, an example not to follow, and that's what we mean by negative example. And to whom is the gospel to be made known? Well, those who are not Christians, those who are in their sins and separated from God and destined to a devil's hell. And when you look again through the book of conversions, some of the acts of some of the apostles that the inspired Luke records, on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 14 through 41, you have people who are devout religious people, Jews, but they were lost. That's some of the people we want to evangelize, people like that. Very religious people, but they're wrong. Or you have like the Ethiopian eunuch, again, a very religious man, a man up high in a government, and yet he didn't know the truth, Acts 8, 26 through 40. You have characters who are basically like the college professors, men of Athens, Acts 17, 22 through 31, but the gospel was preached to them. We may think those folks wouldn't pay any attention to anything. And you know, in that case, a lot of them didn't. But there were even some won to the Lord by the gospel there as Paul preached it. Then you have a government people like Felix and Drusilla, Acts 24, 10 through 27. And you know, they heard and he said, well, you go your way now. In more convenient season, I'll call upon you. But you know, that man, when he stands at the judgment, will never be able to say, I did not have the opportunity. So there's a lot of people that we sometimes don't think would pay one bit of attention to the gospel. The book of Acts shows the gospel was preached to. Paul reasoned with them, and that's the only way to properly preach the truth. He reasoned with them of righteousness, temperance, self-control, and righteousness. We're to teach the gospel to the church. That has to do with growing and developing and understanding. It has to do with making our faith stronger. That's how we edify. That's how we continue to grow. There's the need for admonition. It's easy to slack off. The best of people find it easy to slack off. And it usually slips up on us. But we do. And so there needs to be teaching in the Bible that admonishes us and makes us understand it's not over till it's over. There are the negligent in the church. There are the lukewarm in the church. Revelation 3 and verse 15. Are they to be neglected? After all, at one point they heard and believed and obeyed the gospel. They need to be taught about their negligence and how lukewarm they've become. Then you have the outright apostate. Those who have just renounced for whatever reason uh, Christianity. Peter deals, deals with those in 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22. You see, we have that obligation as faithful in the church to continue to state those things that they need to hear, whether they're faithful and need edification and admonishing, or whether they're negligent or lukewarm, or whether they're apostate. One thing that helps us on that is to look back at the prophets' work with ancient Israel, and you'll see just how they did that. They dealt with every one of these in fleshly Israel long ago, as we read in the New Te Old Testament. Well, by what means do we spread the gospel? Do we teach the word? Well, by every righteous, which means by every authorized manner, that is, as the scriptures authorize us, that is judged to be expedient or advantageous. Right now, the pulpit's being used. What about classes? We use them today. And maybe many of you have personal work, one-on-one. -on -one. Then there are the newspapers, there are the tracks, there's the radio, there's the television. And of course we've had one in recent years added that wasn't around a few years ago, and that's computers and the internet. I, I'm still, and I must pause here and say, we have got, there's no reason that every member of the church, if you're only on Facebook, that you can't teach the truth. I don't understand that, how members of the church and all of that mean can sit there and talk about what tulips are growing up next door. 
or whose baby burped when. Oh, that's really good. But teach the gospel. Teach the gospel. I don't know what's wrong with that. There's been all sorts of so-called campaigns for Christ. We've had gospel meetings and every kind of thing under the sun. And don't forget debates. Some people don't like debates, but some people don't like preachers. But if debates are what they ought to be, pattern on the Bible, it's the greatest way I know of uh, to show how that the truth matches up to error. It's amazing how many of my brethren determine right and wrong on the basis of what they like and dislike, rather than on the basis of the Word of God. I suppose if every preacher operated like some brethren, then I'd have to say I don't like any of you, so I'm not going to preach to you anymore. Likes and dislikes makes no difference. So all of these matters involve expediency. In other words, the obligation to preach the Word involves what's the best way and quickest way to get the Word out to people under given circumstances. Uh, what are the duties of elders then in the face of this all-important work? The elder faces the responsibility, and we've already established that in Acts 20, verse 28, of self-discipline. No person who's going to serve God as an elder should be having to be cranked up all the time to get them to do something. There ought to be self-discipline. That's part of being mature, the qualifications they meet, the totality of them, and their impact on a person. As I say, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers. So before being appointed to be an elder, one faces the responsibility of qualifying himself for that great work. I, I don't think I can overly emphasize that in this whole series of so you want to be an elder. That means so you want to meet the qualifications. That means so you want to qualify yourself. That means so you want to change your life. If it's very radical, fine. So that you'll be the person that you need to be and that's what God says you need to be the Bible makes it clear that one must be qualified before being appointed to elder some of us Jeff's not here and, uh, John's not here but some of us have served in places to where people in the eldership uh, hardly should have been considered faithful members of the church how they get in the positions they're in I don't know and neither do I know how diatrophies got to be where he got in the power he had in the church. But he did. And you know he didn't get there except the people led him. You ever thought about that? I don't know whether he was the elder or not. Whatever he was, he controlled that whole church. Now how did he do that? He couldn't have done that if in some way or the other the people hadn't approved of him. Think about that for a minute. He could not have had that much authority over the church. Even kicking out people who didn't suit him, even it came from an apostle like John. He couldn't have done it except the people persuaded he had that kind of power. But he had it. But then you notice when you look at the qualifications concerning that one must be qualified. Paul said to the young preacher Titus in chapter 1 verse 7, for a bishop, now watch it, must be. Not nearly or possibly or could be or nah. no if you're going to be an elder he must be whatever's set out later must be it's imperative there's no getting around it. you can't serve as the elder unless they meet these qualifications then you'll notice he said to Timothy 1st Timothy chapter 3 he says a bishop then must be it's not right for us to say, well, we've got so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so, and they're good guys, and, and they're liked, and, and they have businesses in town, and they're noted around town, and uh, all this stuff, and they're the best we got. Let's put them as elders. Does, does that sound like from Paul, for a bishop must be, and then list the things they must be, and to Timothy, a bishop must be, and then list the things they must be? God wasn't playing tiddlywinks here. If I can understand that a man can't become a Christian unless he must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the God. He must repent of his sins. He must confess his faith in Christ. He must be immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of sin. He must. And so it is with elders. I have no right to lessen that. I don't need to bind it any more than Jesus in his word bound it. God has not left it up to man to decide what the qualification should be. If we didn't have any elders in the congregation, how would we go about selecting them? 
Well, if you can't look to what Paul told Timothy and Titus and read and understand those qualifications and look out men from amongst us who meet those qualifications, tell me how you're ever going to do it. And even when you add elders to the eldership, men to the eldership to serve as elders, they must be, and they, they must be. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. They can't water it down. You can't change it. So God's not left it to man to decide what the qualifications should be. These qualifications were set out by the Holy Spirit through the great Apostle Paul. And a man should feel certain that he's qualified. Notice, certain. Certain that he's qualified before he will accept the work of the, in the first place. Well, we want you to be an elder. I don't really think I want to be one. Yeah, but we need you to serve as elder. Well, I'm, I really don't know. Well, but look, we need this few in here. I just don't know. Leave that person alone. He's not ready to be an elder. We're not trying to persuade him to vote for somebody. You've got to know what you're doing. And that's the reason the church in the mess it's in. We've got a lot of politicians in the eldership. That's just all there is to it. Think about it for a minute. If any problem, a sin, shows up in the church, if the elders are what God said elders ought to do, they may not be able to stop those people from sinning, but when they find out they're sinners and they lead the church to deal with them like they ought to, and you have to deal with each case in its own merits, then that can be rectified. The Bible doesn't mean because we go by it there won't be problems. But it means we have the problem-solving book that whenever the problem comes up, we can solve it. If we're willing to do what he said. The congregation should be as certain as possible that a man is qualified before it appoints a man to the office or the work. And it is a work office of being an elder. Think about it for a minute. And we'll say more about this as these things develop in time. But when you appoint men to be elders... You're saying, I'm trusting my soul to you. I'm trusting you to take care of me spiritually. I'm trusting you to guide me and direct me and to lead me, to admonish me, to rebuke me if I need to. Have you ever had somebody say, look, if you see me doing anything contrary to God's will, would you tell me? Guess who's supposed to do that? Now, any of us have an obligation to individual brothers and sisters in Christ. I know that. But I'm talking about who are the under-shepherds of Jesus Christ. Not me. I'm a preacher of the gospel. I have full authority to preach everything in the counsel of God and no man forbid me. In fact, that's true of every member of the church, isn't it? If you teach, you have full authority from Christ to teach the whole counsel of God. But elders have that responsibility under Jesus Christ to keep the church like the Lord wants it. And that means they are responsible for my soul. The congregation should be as certain then as possible that a man's qualified before it appoints him as an elder. After being appointed an elder, one should regularly and honestly take heed to, and that's where we started this sermon today, take heed to see that he remains qualified. Have you ever wondered... Have two, three, four hours because the multiplicity of of, uh, uh, of elders, two or more. How do elders keep themselves like they ought to be? Do you think elders have responsibility to themselves to keep them like they're supposed to be? Well, if not, who does? Well, I know the church has responsibility to. They appointed them on the basis of qualifications they met. But at the same time, if elders are what they ought to be, then they're working on one another. They're working on one another. If not, why did Paul just call the elders? Why didn't he say, we've got to call the church too to make sure the church keeps the elders right? But he didn't, did he? He called the elders to Miletus because of the responsibility they have to Christ and to every soul under their oversight. So they need to be doing that. The significance of this Greek word proskeo, pros echo. Keep on taking heed. It's in the present tense. It's imperative present tense. It must be every day, all day long for the rest of their lives. 
taking heed. What do you, does that mean that each elder ought to take heed first of all to themselves and to the other elders? Well, if it doesn't, what would you have to say? Of course it does. If one elder sees a, another elder doing something wrong, or it's not wise, or he needs to be informed so he could better do something, don't you think you ought to tell him? Well, if not, you explain to me how elders are kept faithful within the eldership to do the work they qualified to do. The theory which holds once an elder, always an elder, is a false doctrine. It is not so. But if you don't watch out, the idea is, well, they were qualified 20 years ago. They're in as an elder, must still be qualified. Hopefully they would be, but they have no right serving as an elder if they become unqualified, brethren. Can people become unqualified? Can you obey the gospel, live for a few years serving God, and then cease to be qualified to be faithful? Certainly you can. There's nothing in the Bible that says once you're appointed anything that you're always appointed just because you were once appointed. You know, start out in my work as a preacher of the gospel. Well, I'm a preacher of the gospel. Well, am I? Or have I stopped preaching the gospel and I'm preaching something else? Maybe I started out well and I preached the gospel and I lived the right kind of life. But somewhere down the road... You know, my job looks good, and we've got these problems in the church, and I, gotta, I just don't want to have to move again, so I start softening up. Now, I'm not what I used to be. I'm not faithful to the Lord to preach the whole counsel of God. I've weakened in my faith, and yet I still travel under the banner of preacher of the gospel. So it's an ever-present examination of ourselves, whether you're elders, deacons, Bible school teachers. Look, don't you have to do that as a husband and wife? Think about it. You younger couples just said your I do's and I wills and so be it not long ago. You think you've got to maintain that? You think you can grow in love for one another? Do you think that you're going to be even more dedicated to one another as a husband and wife as you go through, as Shakespeare said, the slings and arrows of life's outrageous fortune? Of course you'll be better at it. And you'll have to examine yourselves. Am I continuing to be a husband like the Bible says? Am I continuing to be a wife like the Bible says? And boy, when those children come along, you'll have a lot of soul searching to do. To rear them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Am I doing that? So why should we think that once elders 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago met the qualifications and they were appointed correctly and they did for a while what the Bible says elders ought to do, but then... Like that preacher, they cease to do the work of an elder. Well, if you cease to do the work of an elder, are you an elder? If you cease to do the work of a gospel preacher, are you a gospel preacher? If you cease to do the work of a deacon, are you a deacon, as the Bible defines those terms? If you cease to be a husband to a wife or a wife to a husband, as the Bible defines those things, are you what you ought to be? It's not hard. It's just that we muddy the waters. One more thing, the constant or the regular self-examination relates to three things. First of all, right back where we said this morning, proper Bible knowledge. Folks, there's no substitute for an elder knowing the Bible and knowing that he knows it. There's just no substitute. Study to show thyself approved applies to elders too. And he should continue to grow in Bible knowledge after being appointed. 2 Peter 3.18, to all the church, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That doesn't apply to elders as elders, working as elders. The character of a person, one's reputation, what he really is in his heart. This relates to what an elder really is. Proverbs 23.7, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Ken and Buddy are what they are because they think the way they are. Now you say, well, I, yeah, mm, that's what the, you're what you are because you think the way you do. So don't point fingers. Yes, that's just a statement. I am what I am because I think a certain way. That's the way we work. That's the way God put us together. If you're an old knothead, that's because you think like a knothead. If you're a nice guy, that's because you think like a nice guy, whatever a nice guy means. 
If you're an old crank, that's because you think like a crank. You, you will not be what you don't think you are. And if you want to be a better person, then you have to think according to what the Bible says is a better person. You want to be a better wife or husband? You have to think along those things, and that means knowing the Word of God in those areas. Character. The elder must be clean or pure himself before he's qualified to try to lead others into a life of cleanliness. Oh, there's so many scriptures along that line. I won't touch on them now. An elder should be a person who truly loves God with all that he is and has. He truly loves his own family like the Bible teaches. And he truly loves the church. The faithful and the unfaithful. Colossians 6 and uh, Galatians 6 and verse 1. And that means, as he said there, if any man be overtaken in a fault or a trespass, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself. Right back to where we started this lesson. Lest thou also be tempted. He has to truly love the lost like Jesus loves the lost. Like Luke 19.10. That's what we all ought to be doing. We be more mindful of trying to reach people with the gospel. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. We're his spiritual body. He tells the church, preach the gospel, the power of God to save every creature. What are we doing about it? Well, the elders have a right to exhort the church to do these things. They have the obligation to be doing it themselves and be pure themselves as the Bible defines that purity. And then things will begin to be as God wants the church to be. But let me tell you something. The church will never rise higher than the elders who shepherd it. Never will. Because they're the ones who set how high the bark is. They're the ones who exhort. They're the ones who lead. They're the ones who guide in the area of expediency and advantageous in doing what all of us are obligated to do that the Bible sets out are our obligations. Now, I hope in this first lesson I made it exceedingly clear how serious a study this is. So you want to be an elder? I hope I say that every time we go through these studies, that the seriousness will grow more in your minds. So you want to be an elder. If you do, you desire a good work. Well, if you're not a child of God this afternoon, you need to become one by believing Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being baptized for the remission of sins. But now as a child of God, are you growing to spiritual maturity? Any of the men here who have a desire to be an elder, are you doing what's necessary to be one? Whatever the case, you know your heart as God searches it with you. If you need to repent of sins, we ask you to come humbly. Repenting of those sins, confess to Him and praying God for forgiveness. We'll pray with you and for you. God's promise to hear and forgive. I'm so grateful to always end sermons saying God's ready to forgive. God's ready to help. So someday that will all end when he comes back. There won't be any more time to obey the gospel. So take advantage of these things and let's all resolve to live as the truth guides us. Come to Jesus if you need while we stand and sing.